So good to be here with you on a Saturday evening. It's time for us to center ourselves and prepare our hearts and minds to give God the praise and the glory. As most of you know, I am Pastor Chinetta, and I'm always glad to be in worship with you. I don't know how your week has been, but it has been a week and a half for me. So coming back and seeing you and praising and giving God praise with you makes me feel good. Now, I'm not giving you an official welcome, but I want you to know that you are in the place where you matter. And I'm going to ask that you come up a little bit and join into community as the choir prepares to remind you to let God take it all away, to let God give you the glory and the praise. I invite you to come up a little bit more so we can be intimate in the presence and the love of God. Amen. Amen.
We give you our hands to do your work. We give you our feet to go your way. We give you our eyes to see as you see. We give you our tongue to speak your words. We give you our mind to think as you think. We give you our spirit so that you may pray in me. We give you our whole selves so that you may grow in us. So that it is you, Lord Jesus, who lives and works and prays in us. Amen.
bow your heads and pray with me, please. Gracious God, we are a people formed by your word in Christ, but we have wandered away from your truth. We have broken your commandments. We have distorted your teachings to serve our own ends. We have failed to trust your promises. We have refused your mercy. Ground us again, O Holy One, in the written wisdom of Scripture and in the living word, which is Christ Jesus. Nourish us on the bread of his teachings until we can taste your goodness. Renew us at the fountain of his wisdom so we may find joy in obedience and freedom in giving ourselves to you. Amen. Amen.
been put through the ringer. I'm not the uh, flat tire in the rain, I'm late to work, and I'm going to be docked a day's pay because not that kind of ringer. He's lost everything, his family, I mean his children, his wealth, uh, his health, everything is gone. And his friends have come to him uh, to offer support, and what do they do? They spend several chapters just telling him what he must have done wrong to incur God's wrath. They probably should have just shut up. but. Um, the understanding being, of course, is that uh, you do good, you get good from God. You, you sin, you do bad, uh, and, and bad things happen to you. And so, of course, his friends are trying to, to find out what he must have done something terrible for all these, these bad things to happen to him. And Job, not complaining, but really just trying to understand this. His worldview is such that he doesn't get it, he doesn't understand it. So, after listening to his friends go on and on for several chapters, uh, in, verse, in chapter 23, then Job replied, Even today my complaint is bitter. He is complaining. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Would he vigorously oppose me? No, he would not press charges against me. There, the upright can establish their innocence before him, and there I would be delivered forever from my judge. But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. Tonight, friends, our community voice person, Kathy Jurgensen, is sick. Y'all. So I ask that you keep her in prayer. We prepared a video for you that speaks on the topic of grace. And I, it's okay, we don't have to play the, play the video, because I just wanted to share a few words with you, so I'm going to share a community voice. Just based upon Job's lament and Job's complaint, it made me still think of the grace of God. You see, God exists, and if I had a chance, that's what I would say. If I was Job's friend, instead of telling him how awful he is and how he brought this on himself, I would simply say God exists. God exists in the broken spirit. God exists in the apathetic heart. God exists in the anxious response, in the wandering mind, and in the one who runs and runs and runs until they feel totally depleted. God exists. And in the presence of God, we get the fullness of grace, and we get the fullness of mercy, even when we struggle and don't know why. Last week, I shared with you that my father used to quote a, a section of a poem by William Butler Yates. The name of that poem was The Circus Animal's Desertion. And what William Butler Yates was going through as a poet was he just simply felt like he couldn't create anymore, that he was depleted, that he had risen up the ladder but he had to come back down to get down to a foundation of where he might have to renew himself, restore himself, and just take away all the glitz and the glamour. It makes me think about that song, uh, Isn't It Rich, Are We a Pair? We get here last on the ground, we in the air, where are the clowns? I guess we're all clowns, huh? But the end of that poem simply said, Now that my ladder is gone, I will go back to where all letters, letters start, at the vile, rag and bone yard of the heart. That's where I meet face to face with God. And that's the place where 
Not only do we struggle, but we remember God exists. In our hurts, God exists in our running. So we can go to the place of peace and remember what the psalmist said when he said, He truly is my shepherd. I don't have to want for anything because he'll make me lie down in green pastures and he will restore my soul. Let God the grace of God move with you through all of your situations. Remember, God does exist in whatever you're going through. Thank you.
Antoinette Andrews prepares to come up. Most of you know her, but I think she deserves a formal introduction. <laughs> Dr. Tony is an extraordinary grant writer, mother, friend, and member of this church. We love her and we love Christ in you. Your community voices are always moving, and I know that tonight we will certainly be moved by the Word of God and the grace that you're going to share with us in your message. So we're glad to have you. I'd like to quiet you all now. Thank you. I'm tired, it's early in the morning, I need to get back to my bed. 
There was my father's perspective, of course, wondering what the heck was going on. My aunt's perspective, which was, my sister's trying to kill me. <laughs> and the perspective of all the people standing there who were just thinking, this is just totally hilarious. And so you have all these different perspectives, all with one single event. And the same was true with Job. One single event, all of these calamities on him, but everybody had a perspective, right? So sometimes we get in trouble with these different perspectives, don't we? And this was one of the things that was frustrating to Job, as we'll see. But before I get into the specifics of Job's story, I want to talk a little bit more about grace. So this month, the theme is about grace, and I tell you, for the life of me, I could not figure out what does the book of Job have to do with grace? I was struggling with this all week long. What in the world does the book of Job have to do with grace? So um, it, I had to start with what does grace mean? So simply put, grace is divine favor that we do not deserve. Uh, we can't earn it. It's a gift from God. God's grace is with us everywhere we go. We wake up in the morning by God's grace. The beauty of God's creation is a gift to us. We didn't earn that. Um, that's God's grace. In fact, we totally take it for granted, and that's why we can cut down trees to let the space shuttle endeavor get to the science center. We cut down God's creation to allow our creation to get from where it was to where we wanted it to be. And yet trees continue to grow, do they not? That's God's grace. But I really like the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary definition of grace. It says it's unmerited divine assistance given humans for their regeneration or sanctification. And what I like about this definition is that divine assistance is for a purpose, for our regeneration, our renewal, our growth, our restoration or our sanctification um, to, to develop a more godly character. Now notice that this definition doesn't say unmerited, divine, pleasurable experiences given to humans. It does not say unmerited, divine assistance given humans so that they will never experience challenges. It doesn't say that at all. So that means that sometimes divine assistance can actually come in the form of a challenge so that we grow in faith and experience a dip, deeper relationship with God. The book of Job, then, is a story about God's grace. So let's start from the beginning. I'll go a little fast and kind of know the story. Um, so Satan appears before God and, said, and God says to him, so, you know, what's up with you? What have you been up to? And Satan says, oh, you know, just roaming the earth. And God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? Now, the first thing I want to point out is that Satan did not say, you know, I was wondering if you would allow me to play with Job for a little while. This was totally God's idea. God brings it up to Satan. Because what is about to happen to Job is a part of God's divine plan for Job's life. God was not trying to prove anything to Satan. In Job 1, day, God pointed out that there is no one on the earth like Job. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan says, well, says, well isn't it obvious why he is the way it is? Bless him. Bet if you take everything away from him, he will curse you. And God says, okay, bet. You can do whatever you want, but you can't touch him. You can't kill him. So Job loses all his animals, his wealth, his children die. And even though Job is hurting, he says, the Lord give it and the Lord take it away. Satan goes back to God, and the same exchange happens. But this time, God says, well, you tried, Satan. You tried. And Job still has his integrity. He still honors me. And Satan says, whatever. I bet if you strike his body in the worst possible way, he won't be a man of integrity anymore. And God says, okay, do what you want with him, but you cannot kill him. So Satan inflicts Job with all these painful sores from head to toe. And at first, Job is like, okay. Okay, we have to accept, you know, the good along with the bad, and it'll be fine, it'll be all right. But then here enters the perspectives, right? So his wife says, you got to be kidding me. Are you going to maintain your integrity? 
How is true and standing firm in your faith helping you in this situation? You just look at you. Just put that. Just curse God and die. Now, this is only mentioned once in the Bible, but we know how women are, so you know she kept saying that. Oh, yeah.
He was blameless and upright, and that is what God expects from all of us. But just following the rules isn't enough to have that deep relationship with God. Having that intellectual faith is what that is. And we know that God is with us. We can recite Bible verses. We hold prayer gatherings. We do all the right things. But God wants us to know him in our hearts. Psalm 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Proverbs 22.17, listen to the words of the wise. Apply your heart to my instruction. Ezekiel 3.10, Son of man, let all my words sink deep into your own heart first. Listen to them carefully for yourself. I'll say it again. God wants us to know him in our heart. And that requires honesty and transparency. So I'm going to be honest and transparency and, and, and be transparent and say, I'm not fine. I'm trying to figure out what my purpose is. I'm trying to discern the will of God for my life. I'm trying to figure out why things keep happening. Um, like Job, I say, Lord, I'm a good person. I tr I'm trying so hard not to do the wrong thing. I'm, tr I'm not perfect, but when I look out at the world around me, I can't help but wonder why there's so many people out there that just seem to be getting blessed. These people who are not as godly, while all hell is breaking loose in my life. Like Job, I have searched for God. I've called out to him and wondered why he is silent. I search for answers from family and friends, but no one can tell me what to do. The decisions are mine to make. Lord, don't you see what's happening? And that has been my cry, but there's been no answer. And like Job, I must admit I want to plead my case because I know I'm right after all. But, what, but I'm missing the point, and Job was too. See, my focus was on the wrong things. I was focused on wanting to be delivered versus learning the lesson. And I know I'm not alone in this. At some point in our lives, like Job, we all struggle with God. And that's the beauty of his grace. He's patient with us. He allows things to happen to move us to higher ground, a place of deeper trust and devotion to him. He allows us to question him because when we do, it peels layers of preconceived notions of who God is and how he works. How long does it take and what needs to happen in order for our eyes and ears to open? Sickness? Death? Win the lottery, maybe? What does it take for us to truly understand God's grace? At what point will we be truly honest with ourselves? See, integrity matters. It matters to the core of who we are. When we are honest with ourselves, it is an opportunity to discover the depth of God's grace. Bask in it. No longer take it for granted and come into deeper relationship with him. Like Job, we eventually have to admit to ourselves that we spend too much time nurturing the ego at the expense of discovering and returning to the essence of who we are in Christ. See, at the end of the story, God goes off on Job for being so self-centered. How dare you question my motives and attempt to drag me into court? Who do you think you are? Clearly, you don't know who I am. Job then realizes that his uprightness was the result of tradition instead of relationship. In chapter 42, for 1 through 6, he says, I'm convinced you can do anything and everything. Nothing and no one can upset your plans. You asked, who is this muddying the waters, ignorantly confusing the issues, second-guessing my purposes? I admit it, I was the one. I babbled on about things far beyond me, made small talk about wonders way over my head. You told me, listen, and let me do the talking. Let me ask the questions. You give the answers. I admit I once lived by rumors of you. Now I have it all firsthand from my own eyes and ears. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'll never do that again, I promise. I'll never again live on crusts of hearsay, crumbs of rumor. God's plan for us is indeed perfect. And he patiently waits for us to realize who we really are, divine expression in human form. Once we grasp that, peace, joy, love flow in us and through us. And we experience the fullness of a life reconnected to the source of all creation. 
This is a life poured out, a life which the fruits of the Spirit flow abundantly. And this requires a faith that is beyond our intellectual knowledge of God. The book of Job is about a journey of self-discovery, healing, and building. And it reminds me of one of my favorite books, The Fifth Mountain by Paulo Coelho. It's the story of Elijah with, of course, a lot of embellishment. Elijah has been accused of wrongdoing, the city totally destroyed, the woman he loves killed. He has become so disillusioned and angry. He was frustrated, his, his faith tested. But out of the ashes, he discovers himself in a different way and has a transformative encounter with God. And here's an excerpt from that book. That afternoon, more old men and women added their numbers to the labor of collecting the dead. The children put to, to flight the scavenger birds and brought pieces of wood and cloth. When night fell, Elijah set fire to immense, an immense pile of corpses. The survivors of Akbar con contemplated silently the smoke rising to the heavens. As soon as the task was completed, Elijah fell with exhaustion. Before sleeping, however, the sensation he had felt that morning came again. Something of importance was struggling to enter his memory. It was nothing he had learned during his time in Akbar, but an ancient story, one that seemed to make sense of everything he was going through. Elijah woke with a start and looked at the firmament. That was the story that had been missing. Long ago, the patriarch Jacob had encamped, and during the night, someone had entered his tent and wrestled with him until daybreak. Jacob, Jacob accepted the combat, even knowing that his adversary was the Lord. At morning, he has still not been defeated, and the combat only ceased when God agreed to bless him. The story had been transmitted from generation to generation so that no one would forget. Sometimes it was necessary to struggle with God. Every human being at some time had a great tragedy into his life. At that moment, God challenged one to confront him and to answer his question, why dost thou cling so fast to an existence so short and so filled with suffering? What is the meaning of thy struggle? The man who did not know the answer to this question would resign himself, while another, one who sought meaning to existence, filling God had been unjust, would challenge his own destiny. It was at that moment that a fire of a different type descended from the heavens. Not the fire that kills, but the kind that tears down ancient walls and imparts to every human being his true possibilities. Only those men and women with the sacred flame in their hearts had the courage to confront him. And they alone knew the path back to his love, for they understood that tragedy was not punishment, but challenge. Elijah retraced, retraced in his mind each of his steps. He had fled from doubt, from defeat, from moments of indecision, but the Lord was generous, gracious, and had led him to the abyss of the unavoidable to show him that a man must choose and not accept his fate. So when you are, are confronted, when I am confronted with a choice, what are we going to choose? So may I make a suggestion? Us loudly all the time. Because, you know, it's funny because I was telling my mom some weeks ago that I, I'm like, with everything going on, I don't need the still, soft voice. I just don't need that. I need God to scream. I need him to be loud because I need to hear it. I need to do something about whatever is going on in my life. And I was telling a friend of mine the same thing, and she said, God has been screaming at me. And so I had to think about it. First, the hemangioma in my liver. Then a car accident. Then another car accident. Then my back went out. Then I had this, you know, been living with numbness in my leg and in my foot. And now a doctor is trying to prescribe me medication for chronic stress. So, okay, God has been screaming a message. And now I'm listening. Sounds like Job, right? See, Job, when the cattle were stolen, kids were, he was still like, okay, God, I'm still, I do what I do, and, you know, okay, okay. But God had to strip everything away to get his attention. And sometimes, that's what God does with us. He strips everything away to get our attention 
for us to return to the essence of who we are in Christ, to help us to see that his grace is indeed sufficient and his desire is to have a deeper relationship with us. Now, I want to share uh, two videos um, of my father today. It's his birthday. He turned 66 today um, to illustrate the point that I am trying to make. Um, so while that's coming up, the first video, both of them are, have my mother in them, so I did get permission. <laughs> and um, the first one is, you know, my dad was a very, very proud man. Never wanted to ask for help, just very, very proud man, very strong, and just an entrepreneurial spirit. And, um, but over time, he got very bitter, just became very, very bitter. And then when he and my mom separated, that bitterness just kind of, fermented and it was just stewing. And now, as you know, he has vascular dementia and he has no words. So I want to show a video. Um, I shouldn't say he has no words, he has very few words. And I need you to listen really carefully because you might miss what he's going to say.
I invite you to join me. For those who are visiting for the first time, we gather in this circle. It's a circle of support and love and care.
my people and gratitude, we should give back to him our best fruits, our greatest talents, and all of our time by putting God first in everything that we do. That is what tithing is. It is putting God first. In a few months, I am going to retire. And so I decided to write down, make a list of all my must-haves to see if I could manage with the reduced income I'm going to have. So I made up this list and I wrote down things like, um, well, I have to have housing, so I've got to worry about my rent. And of course, I need to worry about food, you know, got to work in, call food, amen. <laughs> and um, of course, I'm going to need to work in utilities because i got to have gas and water. And I made this whole list. And um, I looked at the list and I said, oh, all right, this is all right. I think I'm going to be able to make this. And I'm thanking, praising God. I said, God, I'm going to be able to do this. And, and then the Holy Spirit came over at me and asked me to look at my list again. And so I looked at it and I said, yeah, well, someone's still pleased. But I looked at it again. And what I didn't see was God on my list. I am getting ready to move into a new door and I haven't put God in the threshold. And I just, I realized that what I need to do is to make a new list. And with this new list, like I'm asking you to put God first, I'm putting God, I'm putting the gratitude of my offering of gratitude is number one on my list. And everything else on my list is gone. I'm leaving it all to God to work it out. God bless you.
listen to each other, listen to what you're singing, and listen to what you're playing, and then you can listen better to God.
be sure sometimes people want prayer, then I put them on the spot. <laughs> Bring them on into the church. <laughs> we can all use prayer. I know that we know you, but I would like for you to just tell us your name and celebrate your choice. Uh, first of all, my name is Joseph Romans Jr. And uh, my wife, Shirley Ann. And uh, it's very strange for me because, uh, as I was explaining to you, Pastor Good on several occasions, uh, this is not only a change in church, but this is a change in denomination. Uh, we've been Methodist for the past 40 something years. Uh, when, when I finally decided to go back to church after coming to Orange County, I went to, uh, we became Methodist. My wife was born in Catholic. I was born and raised, however, as a Presbyterian. Uh, through high school, we even paid for part of my college. So, for, uh, oftentimes you hear in churches from pastor, you know, come on back home, come on, I've heard it all my life and everything. Well, for me, I'm coming back home. I know it must be something because uh, it's funny, the church we are now leaving, we've only been in here for not quite a year, and it was a church that we had been in for 20 something years here. And we started coming here, if I can make this short, we started coming here a little over two months ago based on a story we found in the newspaper. You know, the little local. Uh, newspaper, and I was just curious, I said, Presbyterian, Saturday night, Orange, I've been living here in Orange, but I don't know, and then and I said, and it's a young African-American lady, oh, i got to see this. <laughs> well, like I said, it was about two and a half, not quite three months ago. We've been here just about, I think, I missed a couple of Saturdays because I was sick, not feeling, but I think otherwise, you know, we've been here every Saturday. God has his own way of telling himself. We give praise to you. Praise to you. We have a message for one of our steering committee members, Reverend Dr. Don Oliver. He will pray with you. We give praise to God for what you have decided. We celebrate. We celebrate. Now, may the grace and the peace and the love of Christ be with each of us as we prepare to depart. This week, you can go out into the world knowing that God's grace is sufficient for your life. I don't care what you're going through. I care, but God cares more than I could ever. So let that be upon your spirit and your soul as you encounter the world on Monday morning, the world on Saturday night. May his peace be with you. Let somebody know, if you don't mind, that they matter. Would you be responsible and be accountable for making sure that everybody knows that they matter? Peace of Christ. Go in peace. Amen.